Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, Judith Roden. Good morning, Your Excellency President Jonathan, Excellency Prime Minister of Togo, honorable ministers, esteemed guests, thank you so much for being here. We're honored to have so many distinguished leaders with us today for this summit on realizing the potential of African agriculture. More than 23 countries are represented from across the African continent and a few beyond. We've titled today's summit, Realizing the Potential of African Agriculture, Catalytic Innovations for Growth. It's to the credit, really, of the good work and the leadership of so many individuals and organizations in this room, including our esteemed head of state, ministers, the Gates Foundation, Oxfam, Grow Africa, and AGRA, that we're able to talk about the possibility of a strong African agricultural sector and today focus on tangible, actionable steps that realize that potential. And that we can approach innovation today not only as an aspiration, but rather that we can use current innovations that are demonstrated to guide our work ahead. It's not by coincidence that we have filled the room with leaders primarily from the ministries and academic business and NGO sectors of agriculture and of finance. And I'll share the thinking behind that design in just a moment. But first, let me express my deep gratitude to President Jonathan for his leadership and his vision to create a transformational Afri agricultural sector and for his invitation and generosity in bringing us here today. We are grateful for the reception and for the gracious hospitality we've received, as always, from His Excellency and the extraordinary members of his government. It's especially meaningful for us at Rockefeller to share our centennial among so many friends, and indeed we have many friends here today. Among them, we're honored to count Nigerian Finance Minister, Coordinating Minister for the Economy, Ngozi Kojo Iwelia, as a valued member of the Rockefeller Board of Trustees. And Gozi, we're so fortunate to have your vision and your renowned brilliance to help guide us. We at the Rockefeller Foundation are also proud to call Nigerian Minister of Agriculture, Akin Adeshina, both friend and former colleague, both at Rockefeller and at Agra. We have all benefited from your brilliance, Akin. These ties reflect a long enduring partnership and friendship with the people of Nigeria for nearly 100 years. It was in fact in a Lagos laboratory in the early 20th century that Rockefeller scientists made the breakthroughs that would lead to the development of the yellow fever vaccine that saved countless lives around the world. Our work together did not end there. We also helped to found and fund the International Institute of Tropical Agri uh, Agriculture in Nigeria, which has been a leader in the development of drought, disease, and pest-resistant cassava and maize, a precursor to our longtime commitment to agriculture in Africa. Across the continent, our 20-year university development program trained more than 500 fellows in agriculture public health, medicine, and the social sciences, Rocky Docs, as we call them, and I see many of them here today. In 2000, we launched a partnership with several U.S. foundations for the Higher Education Partnership in Africa, contributing more than $150 million to build the capacity of 49 universities in nine countries. In 2001, the Rockefeller Foundation began the HIV AIDS Mother to Child Prevention Initiative, which provided life-saving care and treatment to thousands of adults and children. Today, our work in health focuses on transforming entire health systems to improve access to health care and ensure that illness does not impact economic growth. And last month, we announced a new $100 million initiative to improve the lives of at least a million African people by connecting disadvantaged high potential youth to digital jobs and skills training. 
will be conducting this work over the next seven years in six countries, Nigeria, Egypt, Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, and Morocco, countries where the growth of the ICT sector has shown great opportunity for these efforts. As we reflect on our 100-year history as America's first global foundation, we know that in many of these cases, the Rockefeller Foundation was not alone in its work, nor were we always the original source of the innovations. Rather, we often played the role of an innovation accelerator, bringing together those actors that could amplify and scale and finance those innovation to reach more people in more places. That has been especially true with our work in agriculture. Starting really with our seed development work in Mexico, we worked to create 50 years ago self-sufficient crop production in many nations in the developing world that led ultimately to the green revolution in Asia that fed more than a billion people. But much has changed in the last 50 years. We have new innovations in technology. We have new opportunities in production. But we also have the challenges of climate change, a much more complex economic climate, and a very different kind of global economy. So Rockefeller's work today in agriculture really sits at the nexus of several of our goals, not only to produce food security, but to secure livelihoods, to advance health, and to revalue ecosystems in the face of climate change. All of these are central to the agricultural issues faced on this continent. In 2006, we partnered with the Gates Foundation to create the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, chaired by Kofi Annan, with the goal of bringing new technologies and market-based solutions to bear on achieving food security, better health outcomes, and greater prosperity. We're delighted to be joined today by Jane Karuku, the president of AGRA, by the AGRA board, and so many AGRA staff members. And we thank you, our dear colleagues, for being here. Through AGRA's work, there are good, promising, and proven projects and technologies that are already creating impact across the continent. And we applaud this fine work. One of today's sessions will focus on some of the less well-known innovations less well-scaled innovations than those that AGRA is using, so that we can probe ourselves to consider how we can take some of these young ideas to scale. What would be the innovative finance? What would be the new kinds of policy frameworks and other interventions that are needed to unleash their potential and to benefit millions of Africans? And we're sure that there are many other new ideas that you will identify through today's sessions. But in order to replicate and to scale innovation, to truly transform the sector and maximize its impacts, not just on productivity, but on profitability, we must find new and different ways of working together. As I said before, it's no coincidence that we filled this room with top leaders and investors in agriculture and finance those on the finance side who have the means to implement innovative financing models, to unleash new investment for agriculture, and those on the agriculture side who are focused on the critical inputs and outputs, on seeds and soil fertility, on water and markets and policy. In addition to forging new pathways to collaboration, there are three other things I believe we must ensure will be considered throughout our discussions today and tomorrow. The first is technology. To take just one example, we know there's incredible opportunity to empower smallholder farmers and to strengthen value chains through mobile technology. We funded the GSMA Foundation to pilot a mobile phone voice-based helpline to deliver agricultural and climate information to smallholder farmers in Kenya enabling them to make more informed decisions throughout the preparation and planting and harvesting and marketing seasons, which GSMA is now taking to several other African countries with support from AGRA. The second issue we must focus on is women and youth. 
Right now, as we know, the average age of an African farmer, both men and women, is over 50. With the labor force in Africa set to surpass that of China and India by 2050, we must find ways to attract the next generation of workers to agricultural jobs. This will take a good measure of innovation and maybe a bit of rebranding. For example, running a yogurt factory probably sounds much trendier and more exciting to a young person than being a dairy farmer. We must also ensure that we're creating the kinds of systems that can help mitigate pervasive practices that have impeded women from accessing land and credit, markets and services and technologies that would boost their productivity. For example, we fund a project implemented by CARE International in which women in communities throughout Africa prioritize the planting of women's trees in communal woodlots, which limit the time spent collecting fuel wood and which bring fruits and plants with medicinal uses to their communities. The third critical focus for us today is innovative finance. From models that bring increased investment to the missing middle, those small agricultural businesses that have been considered too risky for, for traditional lending, to new kinds of insurance mechanisms that protect small-scale farmers from the consequences of climate change, and protect countries with new forms of sovereign risk insurance. This can be done in conjunction with other interventions at the national level for protection as well. For example, the African Risk Capacity Specialized Agency, now of the African Union, a pan-African weather insurance financial risk pool for food security, which Minister Ankojo Iwelia now chairs, and for which Rockefeller was an early funder exemplifies this kind of innovation, using advanced satellite weather surveillance and software. It enables governments to control price volatility, secure food commodity imports, and lock in prices to assure timely responses and payments to those vulnerable households in the aftermath of natural disasters and droughts. What a change and transformational opportunity this presents. Perhaps one final comment before I conclude. I know that while we're all here in body and mind, part of our spirit remains with the Mandela family and the people of South Africa, as we all pray for the health of a great humanitarian and a great leader. Someone who indeed recognized the important role agriculture plays, not only in building a more prosperous nation, but a more tolerant, a more peaceful, and more unified society. As he said to Zimbabwe agriculture leaders in 1996, and I quote, there are few better ways to show one's love for one's country and the well-being of one's nation than by working on the soil. And while many of us may not get our hands dirty in the literal sense, let those words be a reminder to us about the import of this work we're discussing, the import of this work to all the people all the great people of this continent. Let that energize us to think in new ways today and tomorrow as we do our work, so that if our predecessors were to meet back here 10 years from now, they wouldn't say, what's next? They would say, job well done. That's what we are aspiring to. That is the goal of this meeting. I'd now like to, thank you. I'd now like to invite the Honorable Minister Ngozi Ankojo Iweyo to make some opening remarks, followed by the Honorable Minister Akimumi Adeshina. <laughs> 